collection came to us uh, because Dr. Will McNally, Willis McNally, uh, who outstanding professor on the campus and the system, began the curriculum of science fiction as a serious realm of study in academe. And that was no small feat because in that period, which would have been uh, late 60s, early 70s, around that time, uh, it really wasn't considered a respectable field of study for academicians. And you could speak more to that, I'm sure, than I. Um, it is, oh yeah, you know, people read that. You know, like, they read comic books. Well, of course, that's a field of study now, too. We have a nice comic book collection and special collection, too. But anyway, uh, but he built the courses with some colleagues, such as Dr. Jane Hippolito, who probably only retired a few years back, so you probably, right. I did. yeah. But anyway, they worked um, and created the curriculum. It was very popular at that period. It taught many, many courses, sections of the courses. And so he said, well, my students have to have these novels, not just Philip K. Dick, but other authors, because he, he was very close to Frank Herbert. And I think, again, just reading and talking to Dr. McNally and his stories, and reading correspondence. And I think he probably had a more personal relationship with Mr. Herbert and his wife than he did uh, with Mr. Dick, but he, he knew him. But anyway, he made friends with all of these um, uh, American and British and other uh, science fiction writers of note and went to the conventions and conferences with them. And he planted the seed, the idea, why don't you deposit your manuscript collections with us at Cal State Fullerton, it will become a focus of study for scholars, uh, undergraduate, graduates, and postgraduate from Fullerton or anywhere that wants to come and use our manuscripts. And back in the day, uh, there was a financial advantage vis-a-vis -vis tax laws that if you donated uh, your works that you had created, you got a sizable tax deduction. So it had that little, uh, attraction potentially but then the tax law changed <laughs> and you no longer can take a personal deduction for donating your materials to any institution if you were a private collector and you bought the stuff and donated yeah you could get a deduction but not if you self-created them so what to do there wasn't going to be any tax advantage particularly and you're under probably no false impression that in the beginning science fiction writers made a lot of money. They did, they were paid peanuts. Mm -hmm. And now some of them like Frank Herbert eventually prospered in a lot of different ways because uh, he didn't have the medical issues that Mr. Dick did and the problems for income. Uh, and so he became a prosperous person and he had a journalistic career as well, Frank Herbert did, but anyway, so there wasn't this incentive of getting this tax deduction. So Dr. McNeil came up with the idea, they would call it a depository collection. And the idea behind that was uh, the donor was just depositing his materials, or her materials. I, almost all of them are men, happens, stamps, that our collection is, of course, there are many wonderful, vibrant women, science, fi, and fantasy writers as well. But anyway, um, they would deposit them with us more or less in perpetuity. And at the point when the law changed, which we're still waiting for that, at the point when the law changed, they would then get their deduction and they would make it a permanent gift uh, to us. But since the law never changed, up to the time we're now speaking this afternoon at 2.40, um, that never happened, that part of it. Some of the writers uh, said, keep the stuff, I don't need it, you know, we're good to go. Uh, but the, the Dick family, uh, Dick did not, because there was nothing they could sign off on because the law hadn't you know, allowed us to give them the benefit of a sizable deduction on their tax records. So that's where uh, we came afoul a few years, years back, 2009. Uh, as you know, Dick, the interest in Dick and the sale of the rights for film, or digital or you know, oral has just exploded over the last many years. Uh, and the family uh, is you know, building an estate 
for their children, and his, Mr. Dick's grandchildren. So uh, that's where they asked to have the collection back so that they could control. Well, they've always had the literary rights. We've never had, we do not own literary rights to any of our collections that we have uh, custodial care of. So no, we're not getting any benefits for that. But that's fine, we have the intellectual benefits that we, you know, making scholarship thrive through access to these materials, which is what we're about, really, in an institution. But, um, and I met the daughters. Uh, there are two daughters and one son, and they're all half-siblings because they all had different mothers. And I've met the two daughters, very gracious ladies. And they were more than happy for our collection to, to be here at Fullerton for quite a long time. But they were looking for, I think they were sincerely looking for a, a larger platform for their father's legacy at a more major university, which is no discredit to us or to them. And um, they also uh, wanted money uh, to buy the collection. And we, we just did not. You remember 2008, what had happened with the stock market and everything, we're still getting back, rolling back with that. But even if that hadn't happened, we did not have any money. There was no one that was going to give us $2 million to buy the collection. So um, they ended, had an independent audit done, and that's the evaluation that the auditor <laughs> said to them. And so they were in, um, in negotiations and talks with the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley who was establishing a center for American literature, California literature, and they welcomed the idea of having Philip K. Dick, a California author, born in Northern California, uh, as one of their California authors at this new proposed center. Now, in the beginning of the talks, the asking price was only about $300,000, uh, but we didn't have that either, so we couldn't match it, and we couldn't give them the platform that the Bancroft and UC Berkeley could. That's no discredit to us, it's just, you know. So, um, because of this quasi-official, well, do we own it or don't we own it? And we have all the correspondence. One thing about being an archivist, I'm also the archivist for the university's history, but an archivist meticulously keeps the historic record. And my predecessor had done that, and in the fullness of time, I took on those responsibilities. So we had in the file cabinets all the correspondence back into the early 70s that dealt with Mr. Dick coming to lecture to the English classes in science fiction and uh, being paid a very modest stipend to organize his papers to deposit them in special collections and everything. So it really came down to the interpretation was it a gift or a loan? And because it was called a depository and we didn't acknowledge it as an outright gift because we were you know, holding on to it to get that old law changed so we could do that, uh, the family had a somewhat strong case that it was just on loan to us for those, well, let's see, if it started in the 60s, early 70s, almost 40 years, we're in 2009. And at that point in time, the um, higher administration on the campus and the system didn't feel that they had the resources to fight a lawsuit that the family was prepared to pursue. So the decision was made to give the materials. Actually, uh, we, uh, the, the instructions were to uh, pack it up and, and ship it to the Bancroft which we did under controlled conditions. Now, there were two uh, exceptions to that. Uh, all these wonderful first editions that I mentioned that were given by a, uh, a separate donor, a collector. Someone, in, uh, I don't know him personally, and I have never had the pleasure of meeting him, but we corresponded. He's something to do in Silicon Valley, and he likes science fiction, and he has a lot of disposable income. That's all I know. And so he would send me, oh, uh, Sending you the such and such manuscript, just bought it for $10,000, you expect it in you know, three days or whatever. But anyway, those things were an outright gift by this donor, and so those were not, could not be reclaimed by the family. 
And Mr. Dick himself had given us paperbacks, somewhat similar like the ones I'm just passing around for you to purview. Um, uh, he had donated those himself, and those were acknowledged as a gift in the correspondence. So we were not obligated uh, to give back anything that had come from a different donor. And over the years, we've had other donors who've given us a small folder of correspondence between themselves and Mr. Dick, or um, uh, one nice gentleman collected pirated copies. He was um, a government, uh, I'm not sure which agency, but he, he was stationed in Russia as part of his duties for the US government. And so he bought all these pirated Russian Philip K. Dick editions. And so he was kind enough to donate those to us a few years back. But anyway, anything that came from an, an, another donor or Mr. Dick had stated, these paperbacks are yours, these copies are yours. We did not have to get back. They were acknowledged as outright gifts, had the correspondence to prove it. So what the family could take back were manuscripts uh, that uh, were arranged and donated by Mr. Dick, other than, as opposed to other donors, and that were on depository. And so it was about half of the collection that we uh, lost cost sent to the bankrupt in February 2009. Um, subsequently to that, uh, this outside auditor said, I really think it would be beneficial if I um, make sure I need to audit all the books that you own. And this is before a decision had been made that we had to give them back the collection. So, the family had been asking the Bancroft for about, I think somewhere between $100,000 and $300,000, which we could not match. But also I think they did want that larger platform for the, their father's business. So after the audit was done to include all of the first editions, the uh, estimated value came out at that $2 million figure. Now there was no way that the Bancroft or Berkeley could come up with the difference between 100 and 300,000 and 2 million, because they're a state institution too. So that deal fell through. And the family, um, I shifted to the Bancroft, they acknowledged receipt, but at their request, at the Bancroft request, uh, once the family said they needed $2 million instead of the one to 300,000, the Bancroft had to decline and gave it back to the family because they didn't want to hold on to it and have something happen, you know, things happen. You know, there's earthquakes, there's fires, there's stuff, you know. So uh, they gave it back to the family. Now, I don't have first-hand knowledge because I haven't been in any kind of contact with the family since the spring, uh, early spring 2009. Not through any acrimony, but just, it just hasn't arisen. And my understanding, though, from the uh, people, my colleagues at the Bancroft, is that the family took possession and it sent a safe somewhere in, in their attorney's office. But I don't know that firsthand, so it may or may not. But the point is, uh, there's no place of record that has it where scholars can make use of it. We couldn't find it. At this that point. explains why. Is that, um, that when they said that it was an audit done, you're talking about first editions, though, that belong to. Well, I imagine that the first there, right? editions were a large part of his coming up with a $2 million figure just because they're considered a collectible, you know, you know how yeah. collectors' enthusiasm drive prices on, yeah. on first, first editions. editions. But, I mean, you, weren't those, don't those still belong to Cal State Fullerton? Isn't that what you said here, that those are no, still... No, uh, well, those belong to us because, of, and, but he didn't understand that, the auditor doing the evaluation. He... Uh, and I don't think the family misled him in any way. No. I, he, I think the family said, please evaluate the entire collection. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, I wasn't privy to that discussion in any yeah, way. But I think they must have said, please evaluate the whole collection. By the way, it includes all of these first editions of our father's works. But the Bancroft wouldn't be getting those. There's no, no way they no, want to pay. No. I mean, even if they were to come up with $2 million, they're not getting $2 yeah. million dollars in value, right? No. So. The only first editions they had were a few copies in mint condition that, again, had been, um, had been filed and archived with the manuscript boxes as part of the original manuscript donation. Uh -huh. So those, and there were only about seven or eight 
I, if I'm recalling right, I have a complete list, but I just off the top of it. And so those, in good conscience, we had to give, give them with the boxes. But yes, uh, this private donor, uh, who many years afterwards giving us everything he could find on the resale market, both manuscript. We have a scanner darkly, which was the $10,000 manuscript, and this nice leather thing. We keep that in our yeah. office. Yeah. Um, yeah, anything, he was a different donor. So, but they didn't, the, uh, the evaluator, uh, who's a professional bookseller, does the value, he didn't know any of the permutations of that, you know. So my best guess is that he, in good faith, evaluated the first editions. He didn't do it uh, on site, but he used our bibliographic records from the catalog. And he, being in the trade, he knew comparable editions. So I think that's why the evaluation came in fairly robust. Yeah. And, but the Bancroft, just as a matter of ethical procedure, could not store the stuff and then have to get it back. And they had no way of coming up. Well, nor would they, though. If that's what yeah. happened, the family's confused yeah. or something else. Um, yeah, I, I just not privy to, you know, to that. Uh, but, but I really think uh, they're just trying to build an estate for their heirs uh, sure. over them, you know. And I think they wanted a, a, a major platform.